you could summarize in three words what success would mean for you, what would those three words be? Family, okay. Hmm? Peace. Become whole. Become whole. Just say Christian worldview would be pure Christ based worldview. Okay. So that was a setup because I know what three I'm going to put on the board, right? <laughs> but hear me out. I'm going to dive a little deep here into. Uh, Chris's world, okay? And, and that's kind of scary because I know many of you think I'm a little different, okay? And I am, okay? And that's okay. But I'm going to tell you that I am someone that um, I may not show it by what I say, but I am a deep thinker and I observe. I observe and I observe. And I have been praying for the last 20 years for many of you the thing that has changed my life the most is, is reading the Word of God. But along with that, I have just been praying and praying and praying and asking for godly wisdom. And if you aren't doing that every day, and if you aren't reading the Word every day, you are robbing yourself. You're robbing yourself. God gives wisdom, okay? And so today I want to share with you some wisdom that I feel God has laid on me. It's not Chris, it's godly wisdom, okay? And, and it's going to tie in. But, but if I would have to say, um, I'm going to draw a little picture here, and I want you guys to tell me what you think it is, okay? Bacon? Bacon? What? Do I have, like, pig on my back? <laughs> is that how you see me as someone who supplies food? Tree, right. It's not a very good tree, but it's a tree, okay? Uh, and I, I, come on, it's my drawing. <laughs> they only gave me two colors. I got, I got green. It's a tree, for those of you that can't see, but there's roots, and then there's the tree, and then there's branches. Now, I'm going to tell you that this is a really good word picture for success or fulfillment. And what I'm going to tell you is, is that these roots are love. Okay? Not this philos love where it's an emotional thing, but the sacrificial love, the agape love that God has shown for us. It's a love that is unconditional. It is a love that is embracing and accepting us and calling his us his children, right? That is this love. And that love, at the end of it, has embraced this getting to be his child and living with him forever, right? Isn't that like, like woohoo? Oh boy, we're not, come on. <laughs> yeah, okay, you with me? That's that love. And that is what we are grounded in. That is what gives us this, this hope, okay? Now, the second part is this whole trunk and the part of the tree. Joy. Okay? So for me, if I'm going to be summarizing what fulfillment looks like, what success looks like, it's going to start with love, this that which grounds me and keeps me firm. Okay? And then that grounding that deep root that is what's going to bring me joy joy is not on a feeling it's not an emotion it's a state of being and it's based on what i know to be true it's not based on the wind that's blowing or the storm that might be happening okay it's based on what i know is true and what i know is true is that i'm a child of god and that I have the love of God. And that's what's going to give me the strength and stability. Now to end this, I'm going to say that the branches are peace. And so I'm going to tell you that I can't have peace 
if I don't have the joy that comes from the love of God. Are you with me? Is everyone following that analogy? So now, if I said love, joy, peace, it's automatically going to take us to Galatians chapter 5 that shows the fruit of the Spirit, right? So what comes next? Love, joy, peace, well, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So for us to live a life of fulfillment and have success in that life, it has to start with us being rooted into God's love, and that's what's going to give us joy because it's based on what we know, not on what we're experiencing or feeling, and that is what we're going to have peace in no matter what's happening. And when we're doing all of that and we're tied through this, we're automatically again going to start to display this fruit of kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Are you with me? Okay. So I want you to, now I'm going to like, you know how you like take a screenshot? Okay. Well, there's a screenshot over here just so you remember. There's the tree screenshot. Okay. Because I'm going to erase this. That is not the eraser side. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm supposed to be doing a wrap-up of the armor of God. Okay? And then I'm supposed to be kind of doing a transition to what we're going into. Okay? And so, just so you know, in the last while, I've only been here like a little over a year, a part of your family here, Okay? But in that course of time, we went through some different studies, okay? We went through Life in the Other Six. Remember that? We went through um, Back to the Basics. Do you remember that? Go online. We watch them, okay? <laughs> we went through Restoration Journey. Okay, you remember that? We walked through that. So, and then we just kind of went through the armor of God. So, I want everyone in here just to be really, really quiet. I want you to open your ears and I want you to listen. Do you hear it? Every one of us in this room is breathing. Right? Every one of us in this room has a heart that is beating, correct? Every one of us, I don't know how long ago, has eaten something or drank some water or something like that, correct? Why? Well, that's just how our body functions and, and lives, right? Well, all these things that we went through, the back to the basics, the life in the other six, the Christ in me or me in Christ, restoration journey, and now the armor of God, that is our spiritual breathing and our spiritual heartbeat and our spiritual, you name it. You with me? Are you following me? And that's what we went through that. And then now we, I titled the message today, Armed for Battle. Okay? And the reason I did that is because we've kind of done all these things that are just the necessity for us to be spiritually living and spiritually alive. Okay? But now we're going to go into this new series, and I don't know if you, I'm getting amped up and I need to calm down. <laughs> because this series is something that is near and dear to my heart. And it's about discipleship. And, I, and I'm not going to go deep into my story, but a long time ago I was asked to stop pastoring at a local church. And it was okay. It wasn't a bad thing. But I came out of that with this question of, God, what does it look like to be Jesus? What does it look like to be your body here on earth? And, and over the last 15 years, God has just been slowly revealing that to me. And what we're going to be going through in this next four weeks, in these different Sunday things, is me just kind of laying out to you the summation of that, of, of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. I'm going to do a video this week that you're going to get to watch at CIC, and it's going to kind of start to unfold that. But today, today, I want to just share something really important in my life, 
and, 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 and how it paints a picture, okay? The first passage that I have is the one that you know I always put up here, and we probably could just save the slide, Galatians 2.20. You got that one? Apparently we don't have, well, you do. Oh, there you go. Do I have the clicker? Okay, good. I don't need it. Nope. Theme verse, Chris, we all know it. Going to hear it again. Sorry. I, Chris, have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Do you catch that? I have been crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. Chris is no longer in, in here. You know, you guys have all believed that sometimes when you've talked to me. He's not there. <laughs> but Jesus lives in me. The life I live now in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up to me. Now, what does that mean? I live by faith in the Son of God. Well, I live... <clears throat> Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to what? Obey my commands. Right? Well, if I don't read this and I don't know what it says, I'm not going to know what his commands are, and I can't live by faith of those commands. Okay? I've got love because of the Father. I have joy because of what he's done. I have peace, and I'm producing fruit when I'm obedient to what he says. In a nutshell, being a disciple, a follower of Christ. Okay? But do we truly understand this passage here? So now... Here's the, here's the hard part. I don't know if many of you know this or not, but I am a dad of five children, and all five of those children are adopted. Okay? Melissa and I had been dating a week. I won't tell you our ages, but we at that point knew that we were probably going to get hitched. You know, and we were pretty youngins, and we knew we wanted to have a big family. Okay? And so in the midst of that dreaming, as you date for the next three and a half years, you think about what, what, what could be, right? Is that right? Okay, so 15 years after we're married, two, what do they call it, in vitro procedures and no success, we found ourselves at a crossroads, correct? Correct? It was a dark journey, okay? It's easy for me to talk about now, but it was dark, and it was hard, okay? Very dark and very hard. And so I'm at a, I'm at a, at a crossroads here, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to draw this up here. And there are three paths, and there's a method to my madness, and we're going to walk through this path three times. But in this path, this one here is reality. If I spell that right, reality. This one over here is false utopia. Are you with me? And this one is God's choice. So here I am, someone that longed to have a family, right? And for several years, three and a half dating and 15 years of being married, you have an idea what that might look like, correct? With me? So at this crossroad, there's two things that happen in this passage here. The first one is I need to surrender the right to myself. The second one is I need to submit to God and his choice. You with me? His way. Now, I could continue to walk in the reality of the reality and be someone that would be fatherless. Could I not? And I could also be buying into the lies of somebody. You know who I'm referring to. About this false utopia. 
And brothers and sisters, I don't know if you go on Facebook or not, but there's a lot of false utopia. There's a lot of people walking in this reality and their face is always focused on the false utopia of what could be, or as someone very eloquently in men's group said today, what should we think it should be. You with me? And I'm going to tell you right now that that is a life of bitterness, unhappiness, unfulfillment, despair, anger. You follow me? But the reality is, is that God had a choice. And God's choice was become foster parents. Okay? And then become adoptive parents. And I'm going to tell you this. When you go into adoptive classes, okay, they're going to tell you three things. That adoption is all about loss. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But think about this. The birth family loses their child. Correct? The adoptive family loses birth children. Right? And the children lose their birth family. So how could anything good come out of all that loss? It comes down to surrender and submission to God's choice. I don't know if you're following me or not, but follow me here. We never wanted to go out and say, we want this child, or we want this child, or we want this child. We said, God, you bring them. And Madison, it was so funny, Melissa woke up one day, and she says, i got to get the nursery ready. There's a baby coming. And five days later, we get a call, and here comes Madison. Madison's almost two years old, and she started crying at the breakfast table. And she's, Melissa's like, what's the matter? What's the matter? What do you want? She says, she says I want a little sister. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a week later, we get a call, and here comes Mackenzie. <laughs> we, forget, we, we quit asking Madison what she wanted after that. <laughs> but the same thing. Get a call. Hey, we, uh, we have a, a baby. And, and I don't know if many of you know this or not, but Bella is a half-sister to Madison. They have the same mother. And uh, when they came into the hospital, this one story we know, um, and they were going to take Bella away. The birth mom said, give her to the birdies. I want her to be with the birdies. That's powerful. That's powerful. And, and, you know, and then we had a young mother that reached out to us that through family and knew that we adopted. And she says, you know, I just started to get my life back in order and I found out I'm pregnant. And um, I have this baby and we, and we want you to adopt him. And we're just like, oh, man, this is awesome. This will be the first time that we've had time. <laughs> you know, because normally it's like, hello, yes, we have a baby. Can you come get it? Well, Aiden came five weeks early. <laughs> and then I remember the morning, I'm on my knees praying, and I said, Father, Father, I want you to bring me a little black girl. I asked that prayer. And, and we had our license suspended, not suspended by them, <laughs> but... But by us, because of Aiden and, and just everything going on. And, you know, for a while there, Melissa had four kids under five, and it was just like, woohoo! <laughs> Kara, we, where are you? We understand your pain. Um, Jeff, we understand your pain. Um, but then we came home, and this was back in the days when there was, like, actually a physical answering machine sitting on your... Um, and it was blinking, and they said, hey, we have this baby and uh, call us back, and, you know, like, well, we don't even have our license, like, up to date, you know, it's on suspend, 
And we called them back, and nobody answered. And we figured, ah, oh, man, this is a done deal, you know. And, and then they called us back the next day. And, and here you have this perfectly healthy little black girl that's over in a hospital in Gary that I never even knew existed. If we go over there and we're scared to death, and we take this little baby home. And she's with us forever. And, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is if I wasn't willing to surrender what I thought was best and wasn't willing to submit to God's choice, I would never have love and joy and peace because I would always be living in this hope for a false utopia that isn't real and doesn't exist. I have never once thought of my children as adoptive children. They're my children. I've never once thought about, well, what if? Because if I live in that realm, then my love for them is conditional, not unconditional. Because I would always be comparing them to something that's not real, something that doesn't exist. Right? Now use the same analogy for them. My prayer for my kids has always been that they would embrace their adoption and they would embrace who they are, who God made them. Because I'm going to tell them, they didn't know I was doing this, I'm going to tell them that the devil's going to try to paint in their minds a false utopia of what could have been. We haven't allowed them much information about their story. Because some of it they know is really, really, really dark and ugly. And the reality of what their life could have been is here. But what the devil wants them to believe is that it could have been this wonderful, wonderful thing instead of what they have now. <laughs> Do you understand? And for them my children, to experience love and joy and peace and to have the fruit of God in their life, at some point, they're going to have to say, I am going to give up the reality of what could have been and lose sight of what I think is not realistic and I'm going to surrender and submit and embrace God's choice. You with me? Now I'm going to take it another step. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The reality is that I am a sinner. And I am separated from God. And God has chosen me to be his adoptive child. Right? Right? And if I don't surrender the right for this life and submit to this and trust him and live in this, which is not going to be a utopia. The utopia is down here. Got me? And this is the only way to that utopia. You're not getting there by this, and this is not real. But if I don't go here, by surrendering this and submitting to this, I will never have love and joy and peace. Won't happen. The world's gonna, the devil's gonna try to show you this as you're walking in here, and you're gonna be constantly striving for something that you can never attain and will never happen. And the whole life of your life, you will have no peace, no joy, and no love. Won't happen. Can you put up the next verse? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What? Come on. That sounded like Andrea. She does that. What? Anyway. <laughs> God has got to be first. He's got to be everything. 
I don't live anymore. But Jesus lives in me. Keep going. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now look at this. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? Keep going. For if you... Is that the same one? Yeah. yeah. For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees you will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Keep going. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while others are still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Is that the end? Salt is good. If it loses its salting, how am I get made salty again? It's neither fit for the soil or the manure pile is thrown out. Whoever has hears, let them hear. I get so aggravated when I hear people say, come to Jesus, it's a free gift. Baloney, it's not a free gift. Think about this. Think about God in this, okay, will you? In God's adoption of me, was there any loss? Yes! I have to give myself up, but what did God give up? His son! He lost his son. His son died. We know that, right? His son left his side and went to earth, and he died. I'm sure that wasn't very comforting for God, to allow his son to go through that. I have to die. Okay? We are all a part of God's choice. But it's costing us everything. I have to give up this reality, okay? I have to give up this false utopia. And I have to submit to God's choice. What's the next one? I got another one. Remember Lot's wife? This is Jesus. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Now, for those of you that don't know Bible stories, Lot was living in a town called Sodom. And sexually, immorality, okay, was just rampant. God sent two angels in there to check it out, and they stayed in Lot's house because Lot forced them to go in there, and all these men of the town were pounding on the door saying, Bring them out, we want to have sex with them. That is disgusting. So the angels pulled Lot back in. He caused all those men to have blindness. And he says, listen, Lot, you and your family, get out of here as quick as you can because we're destroying this sinfulness. And he sent them to a town they wanted to go to. And he says, but don't look back. And I have no idea what being turned into a pillar of salt means, but when they were leaving, Lot's wife looked back and it says in the scripture she was turned to a pillar of salt. But Jesus here, with exclamation point, says, Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. I'm going to tell you right now. If we think this is a cakewalk and it's just going to be wonderful and it's all this wonderful stuff, you're full of baloney. Okay? It's going to be really, really hard. But man, the utopia down here, this is real. It's real. And you can have love and joy and peace and have the Father and know all these things in this one. Here, not so much. Not so much. I, and, and the guys that are in the men's class that we have, I am sure they are sick of me talking and they are sick of me saying one thing that I say all the time, God, you've got this. <laughs> but I don't know how else to put it when you just say, God, I trust you 
and I don't know what's going on. I don't have an answer for this. I don't like it, but you know what? It's not my life anymore, and you know it, and you're going to handle it. So God, you got this, and I'm going to just have love and joy and peace as I rest in that. It, it can't be that easy, right? Yes, it can. Who has control over my thoughts? I do. I do. I do. I, ha- I take captive every thought. Yes. J- if you don't know what I'm talking about, then listen to Jay's sermon a couple weeks ago. Or was that last week? That was last week. Powerful. Powerful. What's the next one? Oh, no one who puts his, a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. There is, I'm going to tell you, if there's any old farmers in the room, um, before we had GPS where like the tractor like drives on its own, okay, uh, there is nothing that um, upset older farmers more than if you come to the end of the field like this, okay, especially if it was a field where there was like an angle, and, and your rows started looking like this at the end, okay? Or if you're planting and, you know, you're always looking back, your rows are going to look like this. You know, I was always taught by a wise father is that you need to find one object at the end of the field when you're starting on this end, and you look at that object the whole time. Now, of course, if something's breaking behind you, you've got to stop and look, but... But if you want to have a straight path, then you need to find an object that's out there on the other end and stick your eyes on it. Keep focused on that. You with me? You can't keep looking back. And I'm going to tell you what. I no longer live. I surrender. I give up the right to myself. Jesus, you're my Savior. You're taking my sins away. I'm going down in the water. I'm going to be baptized. And now I'm coming out a new creation, a child of God, adopted. And it's up to me now to embrace that and to trust God in that and to walk in obedience in that. And I will have love and joy and peace and display the fruit of God because Jesus is in me. And I'm his child. And I'm going to trust him in this path. You follow me? I got one more, don't I? I think so. Look at what Paul says here. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Keep going. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. To take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do. Look at this passage right here. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. In Christ Jesus. Did Paul get it? Paul got it. Paul got it. He came face to face with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And at that very moment he said, I am in this realm. And I'm focused on a false utopia. And Jesus taught me and caught me and bought me. And now I'm going to submit to God's way. That's the story of Paul. And oh, did he impact people. He's impacting people yet today. Here's what's coming up, guys. We're going into a discipleship study, okay? And and bottom line, there's going to be three discussions. One, I am a disciple. I am a follower of Jesus, okay? What does it look like for me to be a disciple, okay? That will be... 
the first Sunday that we meet together in September after CIC. So two weeks from today. And Jay is going to be graciously teaching us about that. What's also going to happen, which is really cool, is that in the evening, it's not going to be school, it's not going to be a workshop. In the evening at Jeff and Andrea's place, out in their barn, which is really nice, it's going to be relaxed. We're not going to have kids, though, sorry. But we're going to do what we call discipleship discovery. And on that first Sunday evening, what's going to happen is, is we're just going to talk together, okay? And we're just going to, like, try to discover what am I already doing that is, like, being, that, that I'm being a disciple in? What are other people doing in their disciple walk? And are there things that I could do different? You know, it's, it's kind of an awareness thing, you know? It's like aware of what other people are doing to be a disciple, but an awareness of what I'm already doing that we sometimes don't acknowledge, right? That's the first Sunday. But it's not the first Sunday. It's the first Sunday of the study, the second Sunday of... Anyway. September 11th. September 11th. Yeah, what a good day. That's my birthday. Oh, yeah, something else happened too, but that's fine. September 18th, we're going to talk about being discipled. And what I mean by that is when we're on this journey, just getting on this journey is being a disciple. But when we're on this journey, God brings people into our lives, and sometimes we don't even realize, but they are discipling us, helping us, teaching us. Shane Good's going to come here, and he's going to talk to us about that. Okay? And everybody's life situation is going to be different. And it's going to look different for every person. There's not one shoe that fits all, right? And in the evening, we're going to just talk about, do I have people discipling me? Who are they? What would it look like if somebody did? Just, we're just kind of thinking through those things. And then on the last Sunday, I get to do the culmination again. And it's going to be about discipling others okay and the same thing do i disciple others am i discipling other people and and i'm just gonna you know you'll see it in the video this next sunday but it's gonna tie together being a disciple being discipled and discipling others and i'm gonna tell you right now the reason that i'm so excited about that is because once you make this surrender and this submission and you begin this journey, to me, that's what it looks like. Being a disciple, being discipled, and discipling others. So if you want to know what your purpose is, there you go. That's what it looks like. So what I am hopeful for and what I am excited about is that each of us will begin to see how God is using us. A brief snapshot into the future. And you'll see this on the last Sunday when I get to preach. But it's going to give you kind of a springboard. Now here we're going to go do a little screenshot over here again. There was three things. Okay, just so you remember. You guys are going to remember this a little bit. Because I did it once before. And this will be what I'll wrap up with. It's not a flower, Dennis. <laughs> this bigger circle right here in the middle is us, the body of Christ. And that's us standing along that circle, okay? And every one of us has this bigger circle that we're a part of, and they intersect and overlap with the people around us. And I'm going to call that our arena, okay? We're armed and ready for battle, right? Well, we're in an arena, and we're wrestling life. That's this journey over here with God, right? God's choice. And in that arena are all kinds of people, there are people from this body or other bodies that are in there helping us, discipling us, okay? 
But there's also people in this arena that don't know God yet, don't know Jesus. And there's people on the outside looking in. And every single one of us has a vision from God that's out here. And it's pulling us this way and this way. But they're all focused on the one thing. And that one thing is who? Jesus. Every one of you has a vision from God in an arena, several arenas, where he is using you to touch people and to show them Jesus. And it is our hope and our desire that you realize that you are a part of this body and that your arena and your vision that Jesus has given you is real and it is powerful and God wants to use it to touch people and to change people's lives. Because that's what we're hoping to do in this study that's coming up. Dennis?